Um, <clears throat> so, um, is everyone familiar with probability distributions at all? Standard deviation, means, all of that. Okay. Um, basically, this chapter just goes over some really basic. Um, goes over some really basic things in terms of statistics, um, but they basically form the basis of uh, most of a lot of statistical modelings. Um, so that's weighted averages, um, vectors and matrices, uh, line graphing, which is essentially line best fit, I suppose, um, and then the power law and uh, law of growth. And then we've got probability distributions and probability modelling, which I definitely did not get to finish. So um, what are weighted averages? Uh, when we have a population, um, we might compare different groups. And in this particular case, in the book, they use the example of different countries and they all have different age groups. Now, Mexico is a third world country, so that kind of, so they, uh, they tend to have a younger population as you do find in countries which have uh, poorer healthcare or, um, or less economic means. Whereas uh, countries like uh, the USA and Africa, Oh, Africa. Um, that's not a country. Um, the USA. August, and... can you increase the font size a little bit? Um, maybe. Let's see. Anyone know how to do that? Let me change the screen. Is this better? Okay. Um, oh, wait. There we go. Right. So, in the example, they use a load of countries. Different countries have different characteristics. Um, so you can think of this as a bit like um, if you've got different fact, if you've got a factor, then different character, there may be different characteristics within the levels of that factor, which you need to take account of when you're modeling something, which is why weighted averages are so important. So with that in mind, you do sometimes need to do something such as this. So basically all it is, is you take the sum of um, of everything, um, or the, well, the population in general, and then what you do is you uh, times the take the proportion is then times by the particular element that you're trying to capture out of it. So in this particular case, what we have is uh, uh, the population in total is about four hundred and. 56 million. So out of that 456 million, we uh, create a proportion metric to each of those. So we divide each of those by 456. And then we time, then we, then in order to get the weight, we take the, um, in order to get the weight, we then times that by the age of that particular group or that particular characteristic. And so instead of getting the overall population being something quite the overall weight age being quite different which wouldn't be very good because um for instance canada has a much higher average age than the usa and mexico and it would skew the um, skew the average we then weight it instead to make sure that we capture a better um proportionality of the population being measured so in this case it's 34.6 Whereas if you just take Canada, it'd be 40, million, 40 uh, years. And if you're taking Mexico, I believe it's in the late 20s or something. Um, pretty, yeah. Um, so vectors and matrices. Oh, vectors and matrices um, are basically, why is it, um, what you're doing with vectors and matrices is you basically take, you can take things like um, your um, parameters and you can create uh, predictions on those parameters. So what they do here is, um, is they basically create predictions using the um, population, the political election, if you remember, 
So the political, the political electoral information related to the economic data. So what you did, what they did in the previous one is was they created a regression where they worked out that the incumbent in a US presidential election would get something like, is it 30, 40 something percent of the vote? Or is it 46? There you go. So this is your matrix. So you've got four, so you've got your um, you've got your coefficients here. Um, so I explain this bit first. Sorry. Um, so this is your general um, linear kind of linear formula. A is your intercept. B is your coefficients, and what you do is you add those together in order to get a, a prediction for y. So in this particular case, A would be what's the average amount of population that votes for uh, interim president. And then B is the coefficients times the number that it occurs. So we start with our intercept here, and then we take our number, which is uh, 3% for every every percentage growth ah oh, what was it every percentage growth sorry there is three percent growth in um in voting for a interim president relative to each point of growth in the economy over a 12 month period before an election if there is a one percent loss so you times three percent by one you see a 43.3 percent vote for a u.s US president in theory. If there is not any growth, then they just get 46. And if there is 3% growth in the economy in a 12 month period, which is very unlikely, um, then you get 55.3%. Uh, this is very um, simplified. Um, but I, I think of it, you can think of it in terms of why is this useful? So why is it useful? So when you've done a linear transformation, what you can do is you can create these linear, you can create these matrices of information and you can use them to map the most likely probabilities for things. There's a problem with this, in fact, that it's just a straight line, um, which we'll get into at a later point in time because they're not particularly complex uh, statistical models. But what that does mean is that you can create a load of predictions. And why is that useful? Well, if you were, say, a... Um, I suppose a political analyst, you'd be looking at, uh, you know, a prime example would be like, say, the last election with Trump. Um, well, you know, technically speaking, Trump would have probably done quite well. I had COVID not hit because on the economy is doing quite well. But then the COVID did hit and then he lost the election to Joe Biden because people, if the economy is going well, people tend to just vote for the status quo, not necessarily whether that's. Um, not making any political commentary there because I'm not. Uh, <laughs> don't want to get into that. Um, but the point is, is that it's useful if you go on to a more uh, more complex scenarios, such as modelling, say, speed in terms of a uh, in terms of car design. You might want to make a prediction in terms of the amount of energy required to generate a certain amount of speed and how efficient your engine might be, and so you can make predictions on that information when you've got enough of the parameters involved. So this brings us to line graphing. Um, so the line, so as I mentioned before, the alpha here is the intercept. Uh, that's the point where the y axis meets um, meets x when it's zero. Um, sorry, it's not. It's the point when the y-axis is uh, what we, uh, uh, how we plot the dependent variable. So dependent variable when x is zero. So um, weight relative to um, uh, horsepower, I suppose, if you're looking at empty cars kind of scenario. And then you tend to have, then you've got this b and bx. So that's just time, how, how many times, you times bx by the number, you times the beta coefficients by x. So when you see b and x next to, get, next to each other like that, it means you tight you times them. Um, it doesn't say that. Sometimes they'll put a dot there. Um, sometimes they actually put a time symbol, not usually, but when they're next to each other, you times these two things together. So um, the example used here is, um, is speed uh, and uh, running 100 meters. 
which as it says in the book, you get to world record speed pretty quickly. And there are limits on the human body that even the very top runners pr can't overcome regardless of their genetic um, advantage. Um, so when you're doing these kind of models, you should take a descriptive approach because the models are not 100% accurate. And that's where later on we come into uh, probability and error scaling because you need to understand probability in order to understand your results and contextualize it properly because a linear model is just an approximation of reality and so is virtually so is every other model really unless of course you overfit it which uh, would lead you to having bad results now um now in so in the in this case it's uh, speed is declining with time right um but um, so that, that's how we create a, a, linear, a straight linear model, which is uh, y, our intercept, which is the point at which we reach the line. So this is zero. Um, so that might be the year, but that's year zero according to our linear model. And then over the 100 years, gradually we get faster and faster and faster. And so for each one in growth from that position here, so if you actually had to scale on zero to 100, that perhaps would be a more accurate way of looking at or easier way to understand this data. Um, so exponentials. So I think COVID is probably a better example than what they used in here, but they hadn't, that didn't exist when they wrote this book. So basically um, what happened, another example is uh, the way how, as you approach the speed of light, you need more and more energy in order to uh, increase your speed. Uh, which is why we can't break the speed of light. Uh, well, oh, not even approach it really. Um, but um, a prime example is if one person catches COVID, then because it's so contagious, then another two people could catch COVID if they meet each other, and then that person could spread it to another two people, and then that per those and those people spread it to another two people. So that's kind of like exponential growth. So you've got one to two, and then you've got these continuous splittings, like a tree, think about it. Um, whereas uh, with speed, it's the same kind of thing. So as we go up, each time we go up a bit in speed, we go up, we double our energy take, or in, this, or in the case that they use, as every few years passes, there's a doubling of the population. And that's what, this exponent, that's what an exponential curve is. So rather than going straight which would be like across there where we'd create a bow we have this kind of gradual curve upwards where it goes up and up and up um if they did it for longer what we, what you'd see is a line that goes like that instead so the curve starts off slight and then gradually gets faster and faster um and that's basically what an exponential curve is they use um uh e in the formula to uh, to designate it, um, which I usually associate with Euler, um, but um, that's what they use. So when you look at the formula, it just has an E next to it. Um, so A times E, E, e uh, or X, E, something like that. Um, exponential to line is basically just the same thing, but going in the opposite direction. So rather than curving, um, so as you can see, the curve is the same. It's just flipped the other way around. Okay, so um, so what's the, the power law? The power law is basically that um, to put it straightforwardly, as put in, instead of what is written here, the power law is basically that if you convert something with a log, uh, or you, or rather Euler's number, then what will happen is that it will then turn it into a linear transformation. Um, so when you when you add a log transformation onto this, what's the log? All right up here. Oh yeah. So natural log is two point seven one. Blah blah blah. If you add that to every number along here, uh, across the vector, then what happens is you get a straight line. So as you can see here, so we have these. We have the surface area of a square, and the perimeter of a square. And as you, and because these things are both exponential in terms of growth as the uh, as the square grows the um when we take a log transformation it flattens it out 
So this is, this is useful when you want to do linear, uh, linear modeling. So, because it removes complexity from the model, which is desirable because the more complex your model, the harder it is to explain. Um, and also the harder it is to actually get the parameters right. Um, what did I write here? Something to do with Q. Oh, I got that from the um, I didn't quite understand the bit about log-log transformation, to be honest. I just assumed that it was kind of, yeah, I didn't understand it. Um, I wouldn't go into that too much. Um, <clears throat> but here's a good example of, this is a log-log transformation. So um, in both cases, when as P mammals increase in body mass, if we don't transform it, we see this curve. So as, Funnily enough, the bigger an animal is, the more energy efficient it is. So it doesn't need as high metabolic rate. So, uh, so an elephant has uh, a slower metabolism than a human does. As you see, what I mean. But the problem with that is it doesn't. We can't. Li we can't model that accurately. So an elephant would be here on this scale, but when we log transform it, it's actually over here instead. Is that right? Thank yeah, you. that sounds right. It sounds right. I'm not sure if it is. Um, I think log-log you... log is when both the axes are transformed and semi-log is when one of the axes is uh, transformed. Oh, right. Okay. Sorry, I, I, I always think of it. I, I only ever really log transform um, uh, one beta, to be honest, um, because I always use time as the x-axis. Um, don't have to think about these things. So log log transformation, as uh, as you said, is um, is that when you log both transfer both sides, and that gives you a straight linear transformation. As you can see, the numbers change quite a bit. So this is one of the important things: is when you log transfer something, transform something. When you want to convert the results back into something that's explainable, you use the exponent. So that's exponential. So the opposite of log is just x times. If we do a natural log, which is two point blah blah blah, Euler two point seven one eight two eight, we can actually just convert that back by doing a um, by doing the exponent of the same number. I believe, <laughs> unless you want to square it, you can kind of do that. I'm not sure that's quite right. Um, anyway, so that's basically log log, right? Probability distributions. This part's the fun part. Um, so oh, they go into a lot of detail about this, but basically um, the most important thing about uh, probability distributions is the fact that, that when you're capturing data from a sam sample population as such, um, that regardless of where that data comes, regardless of if you take many samples, it will approximate to a normal distribution in, um, in some way. So when you, if you were to take a hundred samples of women across a population, you would see this bell shape. If you, did it with me, if you did it with men, you'd see a bell shape. If you did it with children of age eight, you'd see this kind of distribution as well, because we have a probability of, we have the most, uh, occurring of something usually in the middle and the least occurring towards the ends. The reason why this is really important is because we can then create approximations based on these shapes that we see naturally occurring in the world and they occur incredibly frequently. It's quite, uh, quite incredible actually, to be honest, when you really think about it. Um, not, all pro not all distributions are exactly normal and sometimes we just don't capture enough data to approximate a normal distribution. But that's not the point of a central limit theorem. The point of the central limit theorem is that enough samples, not necessarily, not necessarily calculate getting the most data, but if you do lots of samples, they will fall into a normal distribution pattern. It, the normal distribution, the idea that a normal distribution will occur when you collect loads and loads of data, is actually the theorem of uh, to do with big data. Ah, oh, what's that phrase called? large sample or yeah large sample theorem 
Where is the, the law of large numbers? That's it. Thank you, Mikhail. Uh, law of large numbers. Whereas the central limit theorem is if you take many samples, even if they're small numbers, eventually they'll reach not approximate normal distribution. And as such, uh, his normal distribution. So um, the first thing about the normal distribution is that within that we change things into a, a standard deviation. And the standard deviation is basically a way to measure how far um, the dispersion of data is from the mean. Um, and so we, ca we that allows us to uh, compare things that are on completely different scales, which is extremely useful, um, particularly if you want to compare something like, say, temperature and the rates of which ice melts, um, something like that. So um, with approximately within uh, 0 0.6, eight standard or 0 0.67 standard deviations, it's 50% of your data. So when you take a sample from your population, and also if anyone doesn't understand this, please ask, because I know I go over this stuff quite quickly. Um, if the whole point is, is that when you throw a load of information, when you capture a load of data, you'll find that most of it will center around the mean. And then as you get further out, you get more scores. So, so this is the way how IQ works, which is that we measure IQ in terms of the average. The average in IQ is actually 100, but 100 actually approximates to zero. Um, so the, the, if you are technically on this side, which would be about an IQ of 70, technically speaking, you have a learning disability. Um, having said that, you can have dyslexia and be on this side. Um, when you have, um, but if you have a, like say, uh, if you have a, like an IQ of much lower, you'd be around this state, around this point here, which would be extremely rare. So in the tails, you see, I believe, what is it? This is 68% of data, 68% of your data falls right between the first two standard, first standard deviation either way. Then you get another 27% in the other standard deviations. So that's 13.5% falls within one and two standard deviations. And then what are we up to at that point? Okay. It's down here. I think it's about four, 2.5. It's about 2.5 in each of the tails. And if you get above three, you're in a very, very small select group. And that depends on what you're doing. That might be IQ. Could, it could be uh, the speed at which you run. Um, it could be, um, could be how good your eyesight is. Is, uh, but it doesn't really matter. The point is, is that you often see these curves and they have probabilities as to where people fall relative to the mean. Um, so a lot of how we predict overlaps and stuff is to do with how much the dispersion of one group compares to another group. Um, da -da -da. Right. Um, so one of the things that we see here is when you see this strange distribution here, what we're saying is, actually this, the distribution falls more towards this side. So you've got a bimodal distribution in a way because these two um, heights overlap. And you often see, you'll, what you'll see is more people falling on the lower end of height here than right in the middle. And that's because there's different parts, different factors that explain the same distribution. So if you see, ah, it'd be good to have a visualization. But as you see, let's say, uh, can we do that? As they overlap, what happens is the bit in the middle goes up. And so instead of this being cut off here, these two, those sections that overlap are additive. And so it distorts the distribution, although this is approximately, roughly approximately normal. Cool. Um, but that's when you actually need, you know, need to do, consider how to transform your data when your data is not normally distributed, which is part of why you use log transformations, um, which is where they get onto here. So linear transformations. Um, uh, so linear transformed normal distributions are still normally distributed. 
Um, and that makes them useful for doing other explorations of data. Um, I've got to say, I didn't really get much further than this. So, um, but the other kind of distributions are kind of, we're still falling onto a Gaussian distribution. So uh, what was this one about here? down here was the uh, binomial distribution. You st even though you, even with binomial distribution, where you should be falling up, where, for instance, your hit rate of a baseball is either yes or no. Over time, when you calculate lots of uh, lots of events, you can say that the successes of hitting the ball will be approximately normally distributed. So, regardless of whether you're doing ones and zeros or whether you've got a continuous scale, you can still form into normal distribution, which is useful when you are comparing across lots of different measures. Uh, and that's that's about the point at which I got to. Um, uh, so I didn't get into probability modeling and I didn't get on to uh, probability distributions for error. Yeah. Um, does anyone want to discuss any of this? Yeah, I think um, I'd like to point out that um, throughout the chapter, throughout the um, discussion of chapter, the authors never, uh, the authors don't emphasize the purpose of um, a log transformation. I think of, of um, like to make your data to be more normally distributed, which mm. is frequently, you know, frequently mentioned. And I think that is, you could, I would say, quite a misunderstanding of um, the purpose of the log transformation, especially. I mean, after um, looking at the figure three point five, it really shows how log transformation can actually make your linear regression becomes linear, in which the relationship between predictors and the response is linear, because I think. Well, well, I used to think that one of the most important assumption of linear regression is the norm um, is that the predictors are normally distributed, in which it's actually not the case. What's more important is the error term should be normally distributed, and exactly. I think. Uh, Frank Harrell mentioned, I don't know, some time ago that um, the most frequently violated assumption of linear regression is the linearity of relationship between predictors and response, which, yeah, I mean, I think people really overrate um, normality of predictors instead of this linearity. And I really like the author's approach in which they really show, they really visualize um, the usefulness of flag transformation in terms of, um, you know, changing this um, multiplicative relationship into an additive one. No, that's just, just that. Yeah, I think it's, um, I completely agree. Um, I think a lot of people do focus on the predictor itself or the distribution of data and not on the errors, um, which is a key problem. That's why um, QQ plots are so useful, to be honest, um, because they actually show you the error terms, which allows you to do the kind of analysis you want to do. A lot of people seem to, um, seem to instead of focusing on the linearity um, of the error terms focus on just the predictors themselves uh, which gets them into a bit of a problem when they actually start um, trying to model the whole process uh, with, a, with something like an ANOVA or regression. Um, I like the part where they pulled out um, as I say when you pull out the distribution curves 
And I also like the fact that they show later on with the linear transformations that when you add a, a log transformation with something that's not normally distributed, it, um, it causes the distribution to become normal uh, in terms of its error terms. Um, I wasn't quite sure about this part, was it? The, um, uh, some correlated random vari variables. Uh, so they, they say basically if two variables, u and v, have a mean of, um, uh, well, two means and the standard deviations, then the correlation is defined as PUV, oh, I don't want to read it out. I'm sure mathematically the correlation must be in the range of minus one and one, attaining to the extremes only when U and V are linear functions of each other. Oh, I see. So I guess what it's saying is when two um, when two bits of information are closely correlated, they can basically be treated almost like a single um, uh, a, a, a single uh, piece of information, which uh, probably goes into the when you're doing a principal principal component analysis and or fraction analysis, and you're trying to add it, add things together. You can just add them together and act as if they're um, one variable. To some extent, it doesn't say that here, but that's where I assume it goes to. Did we get onto the bit about probability modeling? So I have a question. Um, what is the difference between um, the log weight and the log normal? Because I'm just trying to understand. So in in Figure three point eight. The one on the left, they actually have log, log transformed the data and, and, and they get basically a normal distribution. But then on the right, it's a log normal. So what, what, what does it mean when something is log normal as opposed to log weight? I, I thought I understood this, but I'm now confused. So I'm looking at figure 3.8. Why is that even log normal, the one on the right? I mean, it just seems like unless something on the y-axis was transformed, which I don't know if it was. What I understood is that uh, we call it log normal when you take a uh, log transformation and it uh, uh, the distribution becomes normal distribution. So on the left side, they are taking log of weight and it becomes normal distribution. But if you, we just use weight because log of weight is normal, we call them uh, log normal distribution. But we haven't That's plotted the log, but we haven't plotted the log of weight though. It's still the, the axis is still showing the weight in pounds, right? So it's not really, a logarithm? Uh, no, for the left one, it's in log. Left side. No, the left one is, yeah. but then why is the right one called a log normal distribution? Because if you transform it to the log, using the log, which becomes the figure on the left, then it becomes normal, like what Rahul pointed out. So I think it's just like showing that these two are actually just the same, but with different transformation, I think. I think what so, it means, sorry. It just, I, I, sorry, go I, ahead. I think what it is quite confusing, but what it means is that uh, log normal means you can put a log transformation on it and it will become normal, but it doesn't mean that it's normal beforehand. So that's what I feel. I feel like it's a future state that it could be normal, but that's really confusing if to, to put it. Mm. Well, some, no, some distributions can't be, um, can't be log transformed. You, you know it's kind of impossible or if, if you do do a log transformation on it it won't do any, do anything for you anything to it like bimodal distribution so, they suggest that uh, we should make sure that uh, the uh, values are positive because we can't have log of zero or log of negative values so that's one of the things they already mentioned 
So in order to do that, um, you can do uh, like a log with a, a like a, do a plus one log or, a, you know, plus 10 log or whatever in order to make it positive. I wasn't sure about that though. Sorry. So, so in order to log transform something, it has to be positive. Yeah, because you can't do yeah. a log of a negative. Yeah, and log of zero, I think, is one. So that does nothing. Okay. Oh, uh, log of zero is actually undefined and don't ask me what that actually means mm. it's just is that if you put into r <laughs> oh dear no <laughs> it doesn't like that creates an infinite number um That can I, I know that can create problems uh, when you're doing when you're doing transformations, and then what you have to do is um, you kind of have to go back through and mutate anything that's an infinite number or n a into a zero. I think. So when does one? choose a binomial and one, when does one choose a Poisson? I feel like I'm always confused between those two. So uh, binomial, I usually understand as a uh, number of Bernoulli trials. So Bernoulli is yes or no or uh, head and tails. And if we are doing, say, some n number of Bernoulli trials, say, or oh, 20 uh, heads or tails or uh, 20 yes or no answer in survey, we would uh, do it uh, as binomial. Uh, for poison, I think it's usually uh, some number of uh, occurrences in fixed duration time. So something like a number of hits for this website or number of times server goes down, goes down in a uh, day or so, those kind of hits kind of thing. Got it, thank you. That, that, was, that was a really good explanation, thank you. So did anyone understand the probability modeling section? It seems to be talking about um, how you then use these models, sorry, use this information order to basically work out the probability of an event happening. Well, it's actually the one section that I haven't gone through, so I can't say anything. I didn't reach that far as well. Uh, yeah, it's, it's the bit that I didn't get to either. Um, maybe we should um, go over that at the beginning of next week. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, shall we just quickly go over the questions? Um, I'm not sure. Um, 
Oh, uh, well, you know, that one requires quite a bit of maths. Yeah, let's do those questions. I was, yeah, they look really complex. I think I'd like need some time to do those questions. Uh, um, the weighted averages one's pretty straightforward because it just follows the same kind of formula that the other one did, which was um, that you just um, take the sum of your population. Well, create pro you create uh, proportions from your population uh, for each level of your factor, I suppose you might call it. And then you just times those by the particular information. So in this case, it would be um, higher taxes are supported by 50% of respondents between blah blah age group. Ah, oh, yeah, so they give the number of respondents by each great age group. So, what you do is you take respondents for each age group and uh, you divide those by the total number of respondents and you just times that by the um by the percentage of their support in order to get the weighted support for a um for the tax increases and for the question number two it's asking, um, it's like a, an algebra homework, right? Um, so we have to alter the weights for the age groups such that the proportion of those who support tax, higher taxes is 40%. But I'm not sure about the purpose of this exercise, though. So question three is just basically plot those lot of normal distributions, changing the mean and the um, changing the mean really, isn't it? 
uh, and the SDs. Um, so that would be something along the lines of, let's see, how is it our norm? I think you can remove that sum measure there, uh, August, and you can just do R norm um, <coughs> and assign that to a table. I don't know if you can. <coughs> I was not sure if you could do it, but I, that could just be me. You probably can, actually. Yeah, I um, yeah, because it's like a double assignment almost. So it... um, How do you do, G do density? Is it geom density? Yeah, geom density. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, it did work. Didn't like some of the parameters that I used. Apparently, that's normally distributed. <laughs> Well, if you increase n, I'm sure you'll get a closer. What if we do, uh, well, if we do, um, let's just do 10 and do that, and then that's a bit better. And then if we increase that to, oh, didn't mind that. I find it Sorry. interesting, actually, when you sample um, a low number of samples from a normal distribution, then your histogram will not necessarily look normal. Which means that no the normality test, I don't know, it doesn't seem, it's, it's, it seems to be like a function of how many samples that you have, right? Mm. Well, the the less sum, the less the lower your samples, the less likely they are to reach normal distribution. Um, or, or that's how it works in the. I say theory, but it's a theorem, so it means so it's proved. So a theor theorem is basically provable or almost like a fact, um, because um, you have you have to be able to prove it um, theoretically to the point where you can't um, it can't not happen. So we know that the more uh, the more samples we collect, the more likely it is to reach a um, an approximately normal distribution. Uh, I don't think I'm doing this quite right. I'm not very I've I've never really used R nor much. It doesn't like aesthetics must be large or I'm sorry to. Whatever. 
anyway, that's I presume it's just a bit more of an exercise than that. Um, uh, so it's basically just asking you to plot uh, probability distributions with um, with no distribution uh, Poisson and a binomial, um, and then to do linear transformations. I mean, these should be pretty straightforward when there's a bit of time rather than when we're online right now, I suppose. Um, a bit more interested in that last section, I think. So I think it'd be really good. At, I'll, what I'll do is I'll read through that and I'll add a bit to, um, to what I did today. Um, so hopefully that'll be useful. Uh, do we have anyone for next week? Yeah, uh, so I was going to present statistical inference, but um, uh, Mikhail, were we going to work through this or do we want to just move on to chapter four? Um, phew, I'm not sure, actually. It, it doesn't seem like it was an entire session to go through the exercises. Yeah, and yeah, that's true. So I'm just, um, can, can we just talk about question number 3.8? Because I just have this mental model, but I'm not able to. So suppose the heights of husbands and wives have a correlation of uh, 0 0.3. So if you, uh, presumably that's um, like a R uh, coefficient, the husband's heights have a distribution with mean 69.1, standard deviation of 2.9, and the wife's heights have a mean of 63.7 and a standard deviation of 2.7. So let X and Y be the heights of a married couple chosen at random. What are the mean and standard deviation of the average height? Or the average height between that. So for if you wanted to do something like this, like where would the correlation between their heights, like how... How would you even like, um, I guess maybe a way to do that is to randomly create um, this range of heights with that. So like do a R norm and a R norm for both of their heights. And, and then can you randomly pick from those two vectors and then do an average and then, uh, and then see what the distribution of that average is, you know what I mean? Like if, if that is going to be normal. Wait, isn't it? Um, shouldn't we uh, do this a square root of the standard defeat? Um, well, I, I'm looking at the page 43 now. So we can find the joint mean and I think join is a loaded term or yeah, combine a mean and standard deviation by using the formula. I'm looking at the second paragraph of, yeah, ah. paragraph now. Oh, you know what? That's it. Because normally when you think of correlation, you normally don't see this way of doing it, right? Like you don't think about it as being, um, yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. Um, it's the what product of the variance or something like that divided by what, what, what was that? I forget what. There's another definition for correlation, like above and beyond all the formulae. And it's like not really like used as much, but I think it's like the, the product of variance over like something of the SD or something. I need to look that up. Does anyone so, uh, that? It's scaled covariance, right? Scaled. Yeah, covariance divided by both of the standard deviations. So mm -hmm. the uh, so Rahul, do you, can you tell us? Uh, can you drop it in chat like that link? I'm uh, I'm gonna see if I can find it. So what is that? Um, ah, yeah, that's right, Mikhail. You're right. I just I totally slipped my mind actually. Correlation formula. I didn't even know that this was a formula for correlation just because I guess I you I was just used to seeing it computed and then I saw a talk by this Nasim Taleb and I saw that. It's like shoot, that's how it is. Um, so I just posted the uh, weekly link. Why? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, let me take a look at that. Okay. 
Oh, wow, that's a really cool link also, the, the probability distribution one. Let's see the other one. Yes. Covariance and correlation, okay. Covariance and correlation. So what does that mean when you say expected value? So what is that e e symbol e operator there? Like what does that mean when, when you're talking about the expected value? I think it's uh, expected value is if it's a discrete variable, we take the value and its probability and sum it over the whole value range. And uh, if it's uh, continuous, it's uh, integration over the range, x, p, x. Mm. But it's kind of mean. Um, yeah. Well, I, I think of it as um, so expected, expected value is more of um, theoretical value. So it's like given a certain characteristic or the probability distribution, then you would expect the average would be a certain number. But then, well, what we usually use is the mean, which is the empirical average. So based on the actual observation, whereas the expected value is you know, with the probability um, lingo. I see. It's, I it's think very it close way. to, it's very close to weighted average. We, we discussed in the start, uh, you have some value and you have some probability uh, proportion with that. And you multiply and sum over all of the possible values. Okay, cool. Okay, thanks a lot, Chris. Appreciate it. Okay. Oh, because you mentioned about Nassim Taleb, now I somehow stumbled into the uh, mini lectures on probability by him. Seems interesting though. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, I have his book. Oof, I, this is like a real mental workout um, in the sense that I do it and then I feel like I, I just like even the little bit of statistics I learn, I feel like I unlearn it. It's called the black swan. Um, and it's so he's he's like um, he's like big time into options and all that. Right. But his view of probability is it's so pure, like in the sense that the first time I heard of the correlation actually being described like like what you like the, the formula here, like that was the first time I had seen it. Admittedly, it's there in this book, but that was the first time. And I, it just made like more intuitive sense than thinking about correlation, like the way I had been thinking about it. And he tends to really get down to like first principles, like with all of his, I mean, like he's, he's, he's like absolutely brilliant and probability and because he's, you know, he's into options and all that. And I feel like you, you really get a very um, like not frequentist, not whatever, but like just, you know, probability, like mm. in and of itself. So it's definitely worth looking at some of those things, but it, it is for sure. I feel like I unlearn whatever little I know every time I see his videos and then I'm like, uh, okay. So apparently everything, every, the little yeah. bit that I thought I knew, I really didn't know, you know, and admittedly I know very little in statistics, so. Well, yeah, that really sounds like um, my statistics learning journey. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you yeah. take like one step and then 10 yeah. steps back, so. Yeah. Okay, so I think that's uh, actually the Mikhail, the fact that you pointed out to that. So then you would use the mean. The, that's the correlation is defined as a height. And then you have the mean of the height. Mathematically, that the correlation must be in the range between the extremes of the one and the one. Linear functions of each other. Hmm. 
with linear combinations of u and v, the sum of u plus v has a mean of gender deviation. So, so for the mean, we just have to add the 69.1 and the 63.7 and divide by two, right? But then for the standard deviation, we'll actually use the correlation. Correct. You're right. You square the the you're going to square the individual standard deviations, and then you're going to multiply it with two and the. Uh, you're right. Mm -hmm. so, Uh, U minus V. Hmm, okay. Yeah, you're right. That's that's how it's gonna be done. Uh, whatever the minus one deviation. And uh, the formula, which is that I, I usually remember as uh, if we are thinking of sum of two random variables, the variance would be variance of one variable plus variance of another variable plus two times covariance of both the variables. And whenever they are not correlated or they are independent, the covariance is zero. So at that time, variance is just sum of uh, both variants. Well, but then it's not just two times the, um, the, the because there's also the correlation coefficient, right? So like. So uh, uh, rho times uh, sigma u sigma v is the covariance. Oh, oh, I see. That's true. You're right. So that's easier to remember. Got it. You're right. Okay. That is a covariance. Okay. So. Rho times sigma u and sigma v is the covariance. Rho times, rho times. Rho times. So rho times sigma u and sigma v is the covariance, um, Rahul? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Because in that uh, Wikipedia article that you sent, it didn't seem like that. Um, okay. Rho times, yeah. So uh, there is this so that uh, fifth or sixth line in the article, right? Okay. So, so that that's correlation. Translate to similar, yeah. Okay, got it, okay. Okay. Well, that was really helpful. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Okay. Guys, I need to jump off because uh, I have a call, but um, let me just po post on Slack what you guys want to do and I can present or we can work through this, but I'm going to have to jump off because I have a call in five minutes. So thank you so much, uh, uh, August. This was really great and um, see you guys uh, next week. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. See you soon.